What's up guys, it's Dalm Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. So this is Todd in the Shadows, uh, and the video is One Hit Wonderland, Monster Mash by Bobby Boris Pickett. So I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with this song. I think this played at like every public school dance ever, and then usually at Halloween uh, in high school dances, it was like really popular. Uh, but yeah, I actually, I, I don't think I've ever heard anything else by him. So that's a, that's a yeah, great example of a one-hit wonder. But I'm guessing this is on the history of the video. But link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. scary oh man I've never done a Halloween episode before <laughs> guess I should uh, dress up I don't usually dress up for Halloween but I'm pretty sure I've accumulated some costume shit around here okay there you go blonde Zorro cowboy <laughs> and a mask perfect I feel totally ready for all Hallows Eve now but obviously there really isn't much in the way of Halloween music uh, there's thriller obviously and I guess you can I guess you can listen to horror movie soundtracks or you can listen to like uh, the cramps or Rob Zombie or bands like that but really it's not fair every Christmas we get a damn ton of Christmas music piled on us but there's only one song that's really associated with the darkest and most macabre most evil of all days I was working in the lab late one night my... yes the monster man. I don't think I've ever seen him actually sing this song. That is, his eyes when it's say is so funny. Number one hit in 1962 and recharting in 1970 and 1973 and heard every October since then without fail. The Monster Match is to Halloween what Jingle Bells is to Christmas. All Lang Syne is to New Year's. And the sound of drunks puking on the sidewalk is to St. Patrick's Day. I don't think I've, I've ever heard that Alt Lang Syne. What is that? You did the Monster Match. What is it about this song? Why does it refuse to go away? For the love of God, why does it even exist? What would possess someone to write something like this? And who exactly is this Bob Newhart looking Joker singing it? Everyone knows this song, and yet I bet half of you have no idea what this guy's name is, despite the fact that I displayed it on screen just a second ago. Uh, I, I've never seen him before in my life. The funny, I've heard this song, I bet you, a million times. Like It used to be played at like every public school dance. Halloween every year. I bet you, like, you still, if you go to, like, a club on Halloween, they probably play this fucking song or, like, a techno remix or something. Well, get ready for a history lesson, folks. We're about to go way back for this one. Let's find out whatever happened to the Transylvania Twist. Whatever happened to my Transylvania Twist? It's not the match. It's not the match. Bobby Pickett was a Korean War vet who moved out to Los Angeles to become an actor and or stand-up comedian. He didn't really expect a career in music, but some buddies of his drafted him into their doo group, The Cordials. Now, one of the songs they performed was a cover of Little Darling by the Diamonds, but out of boredom one day, he asked if he could sing their signature tune in a Boris Karloff impression. We don't have that footage, obviously, but you can imagine what it sounded like. My darling, I need you. Apparently, it was hilarious at the time. So hilarious that one of his bandmates pushed him to make a whole song based around it. Specifically, he suggested a whole Frankenstein dance craze. Now, why the hell did Pickett think that this dumb little thing would be a hit? Well, you need to understand the context. Namely, that the early 1960s pop scene was phenomenally stupid. <laughs> The era between Elvis getting drafted and the start of Beatlemania is generally recognized as rock historians as a pretty dark time. Not that there wasn't any good music being made, because there was, but... Uh, this, uh, man, you know what's funny? This is actually a banger song. I know this song. There was also a lot of Pat Boone, a lot of completely worthless teen idols, and a whole lot of talentlessness. On top of that, it was the glory era of the inane novelty song. Hell, Monster Match wasn't even the first goofy Halloween song to hit the top ten. The orders were fine. But I choked on my wine when I learned that the main course was me. The danger of 50s rock and roll had been neutered. The era of psychedelia and free love were a distant dream of the future. And in the meantime... Hello, Mara. Hello, Fada. Man, I know that song, too. <laughs> Yeah, re remember that whenever your parents talk about how much better music was when they were kids, all right? And the other big... My, my 
parents weren't even fucking born yet. My grandparents were kids when this it was popular. Thing in the early 60s was dance crazes. A lot of dance crazes. The one the Monster Mash is parodying is Mashed Potato Time, but it could have been one of anything, like the Twist, the Peppermint Twist, the Locomotion, the Watusi. The Man, you know what's funny is, so this video is almost 10 years old, but how much we're like in this era now again, it feels like. Like you you have so many dance crazes again now, and so much of that is like driven by TikTok, and you have so many of these like dumb songs that are like crazy popular now just because of like a 30 second snippet that you get like all these good looking girls on TikTok doing like little dances too, and nobody gives a shit about the song. They just want to see some fucking, you know, super hot fucking 20 something year old shake her tits to it. The Pony, the Holy Gully, there were a bunch of them. And there was one other major factor in Monster Mash's success, the changing trends in horror. In the 30s and 40s, the Universal Movie Monsters terrified millions, but by the 60s, they were pretty much done. Audiences were turning to newer bad guys like zombies and Satan and knife-wielding maniacs, while the classic monsters devolved into kitsch and children's toys. The monsters were just around the corner. So basically, there was no other time in history that the Monster Mash could have been made. Pickett took it to a producer friend of his, a guy named Gary S. Paxton who a couple years earlier had had a big hit with his band The Hollywood Argyles with Alley Oop, a song about a cartoon caveman. He got a big ugly club and a head full of how I do. See, this, this is exactly the kind of crap I was talking about, okay? Paxton assembled a bunch of crypt kickers to record the song, including future legend Leon Russell, and released it in August 1962. By Halloween, it was the number one song in the country. I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. For my monster from his slab began to rise, and suddenly, to my surprise, he did the match. He did the monster match. The monster match. Okay. <laughs> Elvis Presley reportedly called the Monster Mash the stupidest thing he had ever heard in his life, and believe me, Elvis would know about stupid recordings. Actually, I like that song. That makes a good that song. With it, too. <laughs> it was basically just the mashed potato with Frankenstein arms. I, I demonstrate, but uh, this uh, swig is a little precarious. Zombies were having fun. Okay, so what the Monster Mash is about is that Dr. Frankenstein's monster starts doing a dance and then all the other monsters join in. The joke is that horrible monsters have fun too. The scene was rocky, all were digging the sound. Igor on chains, back by his baying hound. And that's pretty much it. It's, it's one joke. And I'll be honest, it's not a particularly funny one. But then I'm saying that because I live in a world that Monster Mash helped create. Wacky monsters were still a new idea back then. I mean, sure, they terrorized Abbott and Costello every now and then, but when were they ever the stars of their own comedy? Would we have the monsters without the Monster Mash? Would we have Rocky Horror? Would we have Hotel Transylvania? Okay, okay that last one's not an endorsement, I realize, but you get my point. When you get to my door, tell them Boris He was credited on the record as Bobby Boris Pickett because of his Karloff impression. And seriously, that's a pretty damn good impression. But here's the real Karloff for comparison. Oh, it's a, it's a horrible sight. What do you see? Myself laughing. It's a terrible sight. <laughs> for the record, Karloff himself performed the song on TV once, but that footage has been lost to time, apparently, which uh, is a real shame. Another fun fact, the BBC banned it that year for being too macabre. And people say the Brits have a stick up their ass. Pshaw. My monster mash is the hit of the land. Okay, so I've covered all the reasons why it was timely, but why has the monster mash survived some 60 goddamn years after it was released? Surely just the fact that we don't have any other Halloween music can't explain it alone. I mean, we've got, you know, other actual, like, scary stuff to listen to. We've got your Marilyn Mansons and shit. Well, the answer, as far as I can tell, is that Monster Mash lives on precisely because it's stupid and not scary. Because, let's face it, Halloween isn't scary. Yeah. What was I, think, I think a big reason is that, like, if you look at, like, especially, like, the, the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s, when you kind of have the sat satanic panic going on, and maybe he'll talk about this, but... Marilyn Manson and like Dracula, the fucking uh, Rob Zombie, like all of that kind of stuff. It was popular, but that was like adult music, right? Like there definitely were kids listening to it. I mean, I was a kid at the time listening to it, but 
it was not seen as kids' music, right? So it wasn't something that your your public school dance is not going to be playing that stuff, right? Even if it is kind of like creepy and eerie. And also, it's they're, they're, those things, the music videos more so are like very, I guess, Halloween-y. Um, but the themes of the songs not necessarily are. I mean, they're dark, but they're not like Halloween-y monsters, like, you know, stuff like that. Whereas the Monster Match very much is, right? It's 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 very much like it fits the vibe of Halloween more so than like a Marilyn Manson or a Rob Zombie does, even if they do have these kind of like dark tones to their songs. You know, the music videos obviously fit Halloween very well, um, but the, the lyrics don't necessarily on their own. When was the last time you had even remotely scary Halloween? You ever get attacked by vampires or psycho killers or, I don't know, possessed ventriloquist dummies or something? No. No, you spent Halloween in a silly outfit collecting and binging on candy until you're old enough to spend it binging on beer. The Monster Match might be a Halloween song or a novelty song, but mostly it's a party song. And in that sense, Monster Mash perfectly encapsulates what Halloween is all about. But it wasn't all fun and games for the Monster Mash because now we have to deal with the scariest part of all, trying to come up with a second hit. <laughs> Why am I still wearing this? The failed fall. You know, I know I've said in the past that my purpose for One Hit Wonderland is to shine a light on unfairly maligned bands and artists, but that's mostly a secondary goal. It's actually to collect ridiculous pop culture ephemera like Dance of the Kung Fu. And folks, we have a goddamn gold mine tonight. Pickett had two more charting singles, though it would be a stretch to call them hits. The first peaked at number 30 a couple months after Monsters Monster Holiday. Mash, a Christmas jam called Monster's Holiday. But they were up to no good. Didn't act like good monsters should. But it sounds like a parody of his own song. They found themselves a new prey. They plan to rob Santa's sleigh. Yes, <laughs> in this version, the monsters plot to kidnap Santa for his goodies until Santa steps in and resolves everything. Yeah, you may recognize this as basically the plot of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Now, there are differences, obviously, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised to find out that Tim Burton was inspired entirely by this song. Either that or they both took inspiration from the same source. The amount of money you can generate with a double holiday cash in. Kudos, Mr. Pickett. Both Monster Mash and Monster's Holiday can be found on the album The Original Monster Mash. I actually found a downloadable copy of Bobby Boris Pickett's only full length LP and it is amazing. Mm. It features such classic tracks as Monster Minuet, Monster Motion, and Monster Mash Party, as well as hip horror themed parodies of current dance trends like the Scully Gully, and of course the obligatory inclusion of the Transylvania Twist. Drac is of course very happy about that. The whole thing is worth it alone for a not at all dated parody of teen idol Fabian, entitled Rabian, the Fiend Age Idol. A werewolf. I don't even know who Fabian is, but that's gold. Whoa, whoa, whoa. When I'm on the prowl, and I hear your growl, I wanna howl. I feel like Man, it sounds like fucking uh, folk punk. It sounds like a folk punk song. My life is complete now. Okay, after the release of the Monster Mash, he only ever had one super low charting single ever again in 1963. The wacky, spooky, madcap comedy classic, Graduation Day. A time will Actually, it sounds pretty good. Graduation day. Yeah, okay, Dover Boy. Whatever. Shut up. Is this what they you used to play at everyone's graduation before? Uh... <clears throat> I remember when, when I was in school, they would play uh, Green Days, what's it? it's Time of Your Life. They would play that, and they played that up until, I want to say like four or five years ago, because I remember going to my little cousin's uh, grade 8 graduation. And they were still playing that song as the graduation song. Although now everyone seems to play the uh, the Juice World. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song, but he did a graduation song with somebody. And that seems to be the new one. So finally, after like, what, 15, 20 years, they finally found a new graduation song. I'm guessing that was the big one before. Thought Monster's Holiday was a shameless recycling of his only hit? What about the Monster Swim? Yes. 
the Werewolf Watusi. 150 wiggling wolves, man <laughs> out of sight. The Monster Rap. If this hadn't come out the year before Labyrinth was released, I would have sworn it was sampling Magic Dance. Believe it or not, Pickett also released some non-monster related singles. He did a few other novelty songs, like this one about King Kong, and of course the Dr. Demento classic I mean, sketch, kind of Star Trek. These are the voyages of the Starship Booby Prize. It's five-year mission to sell t-shirts. You've heard it. Yes, not only was he the first person to make monsters funny, he also performed the first notable Star Trek parody. Truly a groundbreaker in comedy. <laughs> USS Booby Prize. But mostly he went on to pursue his career in acting. And he had some marginal success in that. He did a lot of TV, he had a few single episode parts in like Bonanza and the Beverly Hillbillies and stuff like that. But he did have one major starring role in film. The 1967 classic. Man, that, that, that last one that he was in, the Pennycoat Junction, that's like a classic example of... They still do this sometimes, although they're not as bad. And they're better at getting actors that actually look like they could be teenagers, but... I remember growing up, they would always have, like, these people that were, like, very clearly in, like, their 30s and 40s playing teenagers in movies, and it was always so weird. Like, they look older than I do now, and fucking, they would be playing, like, a, I'm a 15-year-old. It's like, sure you are, bro. It's a bikini world. The more I find out about this man, the more incredible his life becomes to me. And he had a career as a playwright as well. Also in 1967, he wrote a stage musical entitled, I'm Sorry, But the Bridge is Out, You'll Have to Spend the Night. In 1995, after undergoing some major alterations, that musical was turned into Monster Mash the Movie. Probably the only film in existence that featured Full House's Candace Cameron and Mink Stole from Pink Flamingos. Jimmy J.J. Walker is in it too. I could only find snippets of it online, but it looks absolutely wonderful. Mm. Someday I'm going to find it, watch it several times, and develop a religion based around it. Mm. Deserve better? My god, this guy lived one of the most amazing lives I've ever read about. I consider myself lucky if I accomplish even a fraction of the things this guy did. Pickett died in 2007 at the age of 69. Never exactly struck it rich, but the Monster Mash ensured that he never had to worry about making rent either. He went on a tour playing the thing all the time, dressed in a bloody lab coat. All I can tell you is the man lived a full life, and while Monster Mash may seem tired now after seven bajillion plays, there's a reason why we still have it 50 years after it came out. To this day, when you think of dancing monsters, it's the sound of early 60s doo-wop and girl groups. Can you imagine Wolfman or Dracula swing dancing or break dancing? No, they do the Monster Mash, <laughs> and so do you. This is Todd in the Shadows wishing you a wild and spooky Halloween. Whoa, well, let's party! Todd spent all Halloween alone as usual watching Netflix movies in his room. He had a request to find a list station 5, but Netflix sent him my best. Man, Netflix sent him. Man, you know this is old when Netflix is sending stuff. I thought it was okay. It's honestly kind of crazy how much stuff has changed just over the past... 10, like, this is a nine-year-old video that I, Netflix sent him. Man. Netflix, that's, it's, that's honestly feels more of a time capsule than the fucking 60s. <laughs> but yeah, it's honestly crazy how many of these people that do these one-hit wonders can make, not only have, like, a viable career off of it, but like they're, they're doing well like like they're not like living paycheck to paycheck like they have a, a lot of money off of this like vanilla ice is another example the dude's worth like i think tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars basically from ice ice baby and then obviously he used that money to do other things but it's it's crazy how if, if you're smart with money and you do like one thing that just blows up and makes you a ton of cash but like at least especially back then when the culture was so much more unified now it's obviously now everyone's in like their own little niche on the internet but back then there was only like you know fucking five radio stations three television stations so back then if you did one thing that blew up you were set for life it's honestly kind of crazy but anyway let me know what you think below like comment subscribe i'll see you guys in the next one